All right, so let's talk about some GI medicines and we'll take a break. So we usually talk about GI meds, and most of the things we talk about in the ED are probably here for nausea and vomiting, or maybe some reflux disease, but kind of what's some of the benefit that's out there and how we manage these patients. And if we're putting somebody on a proton pump inhibitor, is it as safe as we thought it was? So we talked about it earlier, but just to reemphasize, if we're talking about nausea and vomiting, it's usually a sign of something else. So why are they having it? Is it a GI upset? Is it a viral infection? Usually it is. Or is it something that's causing a trigger of the CNS through the medulla receptors? Why are they having it? It's usually a sign of something. Several options out there, very soon we talked about this morning with OB, but maybe on Dancetrone. And we're gonna get that nice antimedic effect without the sedation that we usually see with things like metoclopramide or procloperazine or promethazine. Probably one of the biggest things with giving procloperazine or metoclopramide is how we administer it. If you order 10 milligrams IV push and that's what they get, they're probably gonna become allergic to it because it's gonna cause some dystonias in some patients. But if we order it 10 milligrams IV piggyback and they get that medicine over 10, 15 minutes, probably usually tolerate it very well and it becomes very effective. So depending on how you order it, if you can change your order set, start giving those two as a piggyback or at least educate the nurse, hey, let's push this over several minutes and that tends to cause less reactions and usually better satisfaction. I'll talk about this more when we get to uh, pain management, especially migraines. And definitely most of us are aware of the black box warnings on promethazine that definitely should not be giving IV through a peripheral line. If it's our only option, it definitely should be given diluted and pushed very carefully over a long period of time through a really good IV. But for most patients now, some of our other things are going to be just as effective and just as safe but we still have patients who love their finagrin. They come in wanting their Dilladid and their finagrin. Y'all don't hear people saying Dilladid? Oh, y'all gotta come to Tennessee. Cause they're there cause they got vomican and diarrhea. They got the vomican. So reflux disease. Try to lighten y'all up a little bit. But reflux disease, usually associated with things of erosion, irritation, a lot of this can be just from simply the food the person's eating, but also can be associated with other things, especially like the use of NSAIDs we talked about earlier. Those NSAIDs are gonna reduce prostaglandins and therefore reduce the ability of the GI tract to produce mucus. That mucus is very protective, and these people may have the classic burning sensation, they may have that chest pain, usually it's worse with meals, Usually we're talking about more gastric, but also duodenal problems, and definitely if that erosion continues, they're gonna develop an ulcer at some point. So usually we have two options really to be effective there in the ED, our H2 blockers and our proton pump inhibitors. If you want something that's gonna work really fast, that's your H2 blockers. They have almost instantaneous benefit. They're gonna block the histamine II receptors and slow down gastric release. Your proton pump inhibitors, though, are more effective, but they're not gonna be as fast onset. And we do know that the proton pump inhibitors can also promote healing, and that definitely for about a six-week course is recommended, can really help heal the ulcers and prevent further problems. But we have a couple options we can give there, but things we have to think about with the proton pump inhibitors. As I mentioned earlier, there's an increased incidence of C. diff infections now. There's an increased incidence of osteoporosis and hip fractures in our elderly patients from proton pump inhibitors. They're definitely gonna alter the pH and may decrease the absorption of certain nutrients, especially iron from our diet. So if this may increase the risk of iron deficiency in some patients as well, because you need that acidic environment to absorb certain things and the pH is gonna change with these PPIs. So we use them, but they're probably not the best for long-term care. We should really focus on other things unless we have no other option. So how many people have GI that want proton pump inhibitors for their GI bleeds? They want you to do the bolus and hang a drip. So looking at the guidelines, the American College of Gastroenterology says it's a conditional agent. They don't give it a level one criteria, they don't give it full support, that yeah, you can use it, but it's not really that educational based on the evidence to use it. So this was one study a couple years ago, where they just looked at a systematic review and found that there was no significance in reduced mortality from giving proton pump inhibitors with GI bleeds. 
but every GI I work with, is want, they want it, and we've got an order sets. Now, definitely it may help with reducing acidity and help reduce further erosion, but for the sake of the GI bleed, it's probably not going to be as beneficial as we once thought. And as you can see, the odds ratio 0.9 in our conference interval involves one, so definitely not as significant as other things. So probably a one-time dose is helpful, but that continuous infusion may not be as beneficial as we once thought. So what about erythromycin and GI bleeds? Maybe people ever, you know, GI wants you to lavage them. They want to try to get as much blood out of the GI tract as possible, which definitely makes the scope a lot better. And that's not a fun procedure for the patient nor for whoever's having to lavage them and suck this all out. And actually there's some good evidence that using erythromycin, because it is a prokinetic, most of the macrolides are, that may help facilitate evacuation of the blood and actually improves the view on endoscopy. And looking at this, we actually looked at this, that we actually had better review during the endoscopy and actually reduced the need for a second endoscopy looking for the source of bleeding. So that may be something to consider, especially if they have lots of blood in their thing or to recommend to your GI people, hey, what if you thought about doing e-myosin and seeing if that helps? And that may be a better option than doing a lot of lavaging or trying to evacuate as much of the blood so you get better view during endoscopy. I found that kind of interesting. So different other agents we can use for protection. Stuff like caraphate. This is a nice protective agent, so it's great for the person who has significant erosion, who maybe can't tolerate other things. The nice thing about caraphate is for the most part it is not absorbed, so it just coats, it binds, it tends to promote healing in some patients, but definitely gives us that coating protection so that the acids can't act upon the lining of the stomach. The downside is it's usually given four times a day, before each meal and at bedtime. The, also the downside is it may limit the absorption of other things such as medications, micronutrients, but definitely has some benefit in coating that patient and hopefully preventing further erosion until we can do something else. Our bismuth containing preparations I mentioned a little bit earlier, but definitely the things that contain bismuth are very beneficial for not only diarrhea, but also for things like ulcers and er erosion, because it's going to coat. The downside is it does contain bismuth, which sometimes can give people that black tongue or their black stools and they come in all freaking out and it looks like they've got a GI bleed, but it's pepto-induced versus blood-induced. It also does contain usually a salicylate. So if someone is truly anaphylactic to an aspirin product, they probably shouldn't take some of these bismuth-containing products either. But it does coat the lining. It tends to help with a lot of other GI symptoms and actually may do some reversal of endotoxins as well in some of these patients. Several indications listed for you here. And as I mentioned, the big thing is it's going to turn their tongue black if they take a lot of it. So you may want to warn them. And it actually will give them them dark, tarly looking stools, but luckily it's not from a GI bleed. So we mentioned Cytotec this morning with OB, but definitely if someone has an NSAID-induced ulcer, then Cytotec is our one agent that's approved for that and actually is very beneficial. It's going to promote prostaglandins. It's going to increase the thick layer of mucus and actually is going to help promote and protect that area and may help heal it. But it's definitely going to cause some significant GI distress. Usually it causes some cramping, some abdominal stress. As we talked about earlier, it can definitely facilitate an abortion. So it's a category X. It's contraindicated in pregnancy or women who think they might be pregnant until we've ruled that out. But definitely if they have a really bad inset induced ulcer and caraphate's not working or bismuth containing solutions are not working, this may be an option. But a lot of people are non-compliant because of the side effects. The, the cramping is pretty severe, and most time they won't continue to take it because it's just uncomfortable. So with our H. pylori infections, we know is the most common thing we see associated with a lot of our GI problems, and most of it is bacterial. The current recommendations are that if we're going to do antimicrobial therapy, which is the mainstay, it needs to be the quadruple therapy and not the old triple therapy that we used to use. So if you are initiating this in the ED, making sure we're doing quadruple therapy, there are needs something that's going to help protect the area, but also eradicate the infection. In some patients, due to resistance, the triple wasn't working, so now we recommend this. There may be some benefit also in doing probiotics and helping coat and soothe that area and replenish the normal bacteria that we'll see. 
The big thing about doing H. pylori is the person, if we're doing an H. pylori urea breath test, which is the most common, they have to be off all their therapies for two weeks. And not that most of us are doing those in the ED, but definitely something to consider. And this person needs to follow up with primary care or with gastro to have follow through if we're worried about this truly is an H. pylori infection. And that usually is the case with most of our duodenum gastric ulcers, is it's truly gonna be requiring this therapy as well as endoscopic evaluation. And again, it's getting these people to stay concurrent on not only their dietary changes, but also their medication. So here's a great algorithm I found that's just two or three years old that looks at how we should treat these patients and looking at actually from the primary care standpoint, but definitely if you do some primary care or you do a lot of patients for their primary care providers in your small EDs, then definitely just kind of gives you some guidelines about these patients and definitely what resources are out there. But definitely most of these people need to be on at least two antimicrobial agents to make sure we can eradicate the infection. And usually one of those is going to be something that's going to cover our anaerobes. Pretty impressive that there's a bacteria that can withstand the pH of the stomach. There's bacteria that live in volcanoes that can sustain thousands of degrees. So they're pretty impressive little boogers. And then for our laxatives, there's different classifications out there. Our bulk forming laxatives, these are usually for more prevention. So giving people a contained cilium or something that's going to give them that, that metamucil, and it's just fiber to bulk up. And this can easily be done with a supplement like here or just increasing this in their diet through eating some of their vegetables. Some of their fruits are giving them natural fiber. These tend not to cause people to have more frequent bowel movements. They may. But the whole goal here is just to add bulk so they tend not to get constipated. Our stool softeners are sometimes referred to as our surfactants. These are meant to pull in more water or make it more lipid-based. Again, usually are not considered true laxatives, but just to kind of help prevent or treat constipation. And especially our emollients come into play here, like our glycerin suppositories or our mineral oil. And that just kind of tends to lubricate the area and hopefully prevents or treats constipation without actively causing elimination. But then we get into our true laxatives, like our osmotic laxatives or our purgatives. These are some of your dumpers. They're gonna actually change the water concentration. They're gonna pull in more water and make it more liquefied. They're gonna sometimes increase uh, peristalsis and make them more active. But some can also have some significant side effects of increasing bowel movements, definitely leading to diarrhea and sometimes significant problems with pain and excessive amounts. Cramps and flatus are very common, but these work pretty well. These are not as harsh as some of the other ones, but definitely that person who just comes in in their FOS, full of stool, then maybe one of these are going to help get them out once they get home. And then you truly have your true cathartics, the ones that are going to stimulate the bowel and actually increase motility and lead to evacuation. The bad thing about these agents, which sometimes people use every day, is these can lead to dependence. That if a person takes one of these every day constantly, their bowel is going to get used to it and they're going to lose some of their parasympathetic control. It just becomes re- too relaxed and they're going to have to use this every day, otherwise, they're not going to have regular bowel movements. So, we usually try to avoid these if at all possible and use more of the bulk forming or more of the emollients that aren't going to be directly stimulating the bowel and hopefully they don't have that dependence issue. But we'll definitely sometimes see people that come in and they've done castor oil, or they've done some of these others, and they're going to definitely have some explosive problems sometimes. Or if people might have slipped them a little x lax in their cookie instead of true chocolate, have those side effects. But these patients are probably going to be okay. Probably biscadol, docolax is our most effective and safest one, but definitely any of them can lead to dependence over time. And our antidiarrheals, whether we're talking about diphenoxylate and atropine, or we're talking about emodium, which is over the counter. Both of these are going to be weak mu agonists, so they're going to stimulate the mu receptors in the GI tract and slow down peristalsis and hopefully slow down the evacuation. We've seen in recent years an increase in abuse of these agents because they are mu agonist, and actually people are taking boxes and boxes of lamodial or emodium, and we're seeing significant systemic effects. As you see, that. Uh, with the Lamodal, it actually contains a little bit of atropine. The goal there is to prevent abuse. 
So if you're taking it to get that effect, the diphenoxylate will give you that opiate effect, but you're not going to like what the atropine does to you. And that's the biggest reason it's there. But we've found some significant cardiovascular issues, cardiac arrhythmias from people who are ingesting large doses of diphenoxylate or imodium. But the whole goal is it's just going to slow things down. And the big thing would be is does the patient really need to be on an antidiarrheal or not? Most recommendations are let's not do antidiarrheals because diarrhea, as unpleasant it is, is the body's way of evacuating whatever it is, usually a virus, but it could be just bad food, and then looking at some of the evidence that patients who don't take antidiarrheals are better sooner because they've gotten rid of all whatever it was, and that probably, especially one or two doses is probably all they should be doing, and especially if it's bloody diarrhea, they should not be doing antidiarrheals. We need to look at other things like some of our bacterial infections, maybe things like our traveler's diarrhea but educating the patients that if we have to, one dose or two doses, but definitely not a lot and definitely look for se severe problems and definitely know that people are now abusing these because they do have that new effect. So good old C. diff, as we talked about earlier, and as I mentioned earlier, there are now several cases of community-acquired C. diff out there. Used to be just a hospital-acquired thing, and we know that definitely our elderly patients, patients over the age of 65, one episode of C. diff increases their mortality significantly. So definitely being cognizant of that, the patient who comes in with significant diarrhea, getting a good history, have they recently been on antibiotics in the last three months? But also thinking this could be something just like community acquired. So we talked about what happens with those antibiotics is they change the normal flora of the gut. They're going to change what bacteria normally live there and allow things like C. difficile or other things like Canada sometimes to proliferate and changes the environment of the GI tract. And that's what we definitely see with C. diff. So as I mentioned earlier, and just to talk about here, since we've got maybe some new people, that currently ISDA recommends vancomycin oral as our first line agent. For years, we were using metronidazole. It was cheap. It was considered to be effective, but now there's significant resistance in some areas. And so what they're recommending is oral vanco. If oral vanco is not an option, then we can go to metronidazole, but probably the vanco is going to be more effective. Oral vanco is not that cheap, definitely compared to metronidazole. So there is some discussion of actually taking parenteral vanco and having them drink it may be as effective as the tablets and a lot less expensive. And we're not looking for systemic absorption, we're just looking for contact with the GI tract to kill off these. And just kind of give you an idea of the cost of some of these agents is quite impressive. And if we're talking about using metronidazole, what do we have to make sure we educate our patients about? No ethanol, because if not, they're not gonna like what's gonna happen in most people. It tends to cause that disulfiram-like reaction, and any alcohol exposure will lead to significant vomiting, GI distress. Looking at some of the references, they talk about they probably shouldn't have any ethanol two to three days before, and probably up to seven or 10 days after their last dose. So we wanna make sure all the metronidazole is out of their system before they ingest ethanol. And I've heard stories of even the, you know, people who go take their little sip of wine at communion on, at church, and that was enough to push them over the edge when they were on metronidazole for their diverticulitis. So definitely making sure your patients understand that, that they're not going to like what happens when they're having severe GI distress because of that disulfiram light reaction. So octreotide or sandostatin. So octreotide is synthetic somatostatin. Somatostatin is the regulatory hormone produced that regulates all the pancreatic functions, but it also regulates GI blood supply. And in significant GI bleeds, giving octreotide has been shown to reduce GI bleeding and may reduce the risk of exsanguination, especially for esophageal variceal bleeds and high up bleeds that are hard to control. So we may see it sometimes used for that. We'll actually talk about this afternoon in tox as a reversal agent for sulfonylurea overdoses. So actually if somebody overdoses on their sulfonylurea, octreotide is one of the options for treating that as well. So probiotics, we've kind of alluded to them a couple of times, and there is some studies out there that show that, hey, actually, probiotics may be beneficial. They're going to replace the missing stuff with live pathogens that are healthy. Probably our one downside is if somebody's immune suppressed, then probably probiotics should be used cautiously. There have been several studies out there that look at every time the patient was admitted to the hospital, they were put on a probiotic and did show that there was a decrease in uh, uh, antibiotic-induced diarrhea 
and actually may have reduced the incidence of also prolonged hospitalization and C. diff infections. So most of these are bacterial, but some of these may be yeast. There's several things available over the counter. There's actually some that will probably be soon out as prescription, but definitely it may be worth looking at the literature yourself and deciding, hey, should I recommend a probiotic to my patients when I'm prescribing antibiotics? Especially some of those higher risk ones like Clinda, or just let them go out and fight on their own. But sometimes patients will ask, and probably for most people with an intact immune system, recommending a probiotic is not gonna hurt anything and definitely may reduce the incidence of antibiotic-induced diarrhea. So here was one study, this is from 12, but they actually found that there was a benefit in some patients reducing antibiotic-induced diarrhea. So definitely it's worth discussing, looking at yourself and saying, hey, if it's especially one of those bad ones like high dose amoxicillin or amoxicillin with clavulanate, hey, maybe we should do a little probiotic with it or just improve their dietary regulation as well. But this is one of the things that we can use for support if we're recommending probiotics with those patients. What about prebiotics? Kind of the new things now, and say we're talking about what we're getting in our diet, they're just non-digestible fibers that kind of help build a healthy environment. We're looking at improving our colon's ecosystem, so to speak, but actually giving things there that our good bacteria are gonna thrive with and help them become strong and virulent and hopefully not as at risk for elimination by some of our antibiotics. So things like bananas, onions, artichoke, Apples, fiber every day. The old apple a day keeps the doctor away. And it was good for bowel, it was good for fiber, but definitely something we may recommend. And everybody who loves some of these other things, but definitely giving the colon in a healthy environment may make our bacteria live better and be a little bit more resistant to antibiotics or for overgrowth other things like C. diff or Canada albicans or any of those other things we may encounter in the GI gut. Any questions about GI meds? when just explosive diarrhea happens. All right, I believe it's time for a break. It's 3.15, we'll start back at 3.30.